Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Breastfeeding, Why It's Important. My name is Darlene Archuleta and I work in the We Care Department here at PEHP. I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Judy Harris. Judy is a registered dietitian and an international board certified lactation consultant. She has worked for the De Utah Department of Health for almost 25 years in the area of nutrition and human lactation and has been very involved in many state and national associations and nonprofits such as starting up in uh, Mountain West Mother's Milk Bank in 2012 and being on the first board of directors for the United States Lactation Consultants Association in 2006. She is currently working on improved policies in child care settings and workplaces in the EPIC program. Welcome, Judy. Thanks, Darlene. The World Health Organization, UNICEF, Global Strategy for Infant and Young Child Feeding states very eloquently that mothers and babies form an inseparable biological and social unit. The health and nutrition of one group cannot be, be divorced from the health and nutrition of the other. So we will be talking about breastfeeding for working moms in, um, in these areas. So the risks of not breastfeeding, that's what we'll be talking about. So you can learn the significance and the value of breast milk. Hospital guidance, we'll talk about that so you can hear the evidence-based practices that will set you up for success in the hospital. Breastfeeding Body Works 101 is what I call, so you'll have knowledge of how your body works and how you can manage this experience and set yourself up for that success and getting it right in the first place. That is really paramount. Returning to work. You'll get tools and resources and strategies so when you go back to work, you're not bailing out and uh, feeling frazzled, but you'll, you're going to feel confident because you'll, you'll be really prepared. And then we'll talk just a little bit about formula use or not. And when you put all this information together, you'll see if there's a, a place for that or not in your planning. Okay, so meet Lisa. She was working with us at the Department of Health, and this is her first baby, and they just did such a great uh, they just had a great experience breastfeeding and, and bringing uh, it to her workplace. She breastfed um, at her office. She kept her baby in, in her office cube area. And she had the, um, the, the daycare center downstairs, which made it really easy and convenient for her to, to get her baby. And um, it just went really well. So here's a new mom, first time mom. She got some of the information that we talked about in this presentation, and she did really great. So I'd like you all to feel really confident. And if there's any dads listening to, you can take the same information and bring it back to your household and to your significant other and carry that through. So goal is for you to feel comfortable and confident in breastfeeding. So when someone asks you, hey, what are you going to do? How are you going to feed your baby? Have you thought about what you're going to do? That you'll, you'll say, I want to breastfeed because I really have the skills. I'm not just, well, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. We, don't, we want you to succeed. So the question is, what are the risks of not breastfeeding? So just like Lisa, did you know that over 90% of women in Utah, just like you, really start out breastfeeding? They have that intent to want to breastfeed. And remember, breast milk has ensured survival over thousands and thousands of years. We would not be a species of existence without the protection and the benefits of breastfeeding. So it really is my ethical responsibility to inform to inform you and families so that every mother and every child has a right to optimal health care and nutrition. And that's despite or irrespective of the marketing of products that are commonplace practices right now in our world today. So I feel this is a, a real disservice if women aren't informed. So I hope I can provide you some information that will support you and your, and your baby and you'll feel empowered and confident and really have the ability to enjoy this wonderful, lovely experience of bonding with your baby. Infant risks of not breastfeeding include all of these things, and these are serious things for one little slide to, to capture, but we're talking diabetes, increased risk of obesity, cancers, celiac disease, SIDS, juvenile arthritis, asthma, allergies, 
ear infections, that otitis media, that can be greatly reduced. And I think I mentioned RSV, another big one we see during the winter. So those are short-term things as well as some very long-term significant things like obesity and diabetes and inflammatory bowel disease. And don't forget, too, breast milk contributes, contributes to the growth and development of the entire immune system. And that's super immature the first two years of life. That's the GI tract. That's the um, immune system. That's the brain development. It takes you know 18 months just to get the first round of some of the brain developed. And the brain is constantly wiring. And all these organs are constantly being grown and, and doubled and tripled in size within just a short amount of time. So there's tons of research, research that talks about how the breast milk physiologically and biochemically can really contribute to the, the optimal growth. And we see some things that are kind of fun. I thought I'd mention about babies who breastfeed, their oral palate is changed and, and configured more appropriately as opposed to if they're sucking on a bottle. Their teeth eruption that, that are very, the eruption is disrupted. It's the teeth come in crooked when they're sucking on a bottle. So the normal oral palate should look like a breastfeeding baby's palate due to the suck, suckling and the, and the sucking at breast. And I mean, the list goes on and on about all of these significant things that really play, play a role in your baby's um, immune system and growth and development. So it comes down to your baby's protection. And I like to talk about moms and babies as being an ecosystem. And there's reasons why nature does what it does. This is a deliberate purpose. And the relationship is a deliberate relationship between mom and baby. And once the baby is born outside the mom's body, they are still in ecosystem. And you are protecting the baby through your breast milk. Colostrum is the first milk that is produced by the body and starts, production starts during pregnancy. And that ecosystem includes the pregnancy cycle into the lactation. So where there's pregnancy, the body is set up for lactation, starting to already um, develop the breast and make changes in the body. I mean, if you really think about, about it, your body is growing during puberty to do reproductive function, which includes lactation. So all of these things are part of your normal physiology of your body's role. So the colostrum that's produced is so important because it has all these immune protections. The baby's gut is like a web, and it's open. And the colostrum coats and lines that intestinal gut to prevent any pathogens from coming in, two larger proteins like other proteins besides the mom's breast milk proteins, you know, e.g. cow's milk proteins. It uh, prepares that gut for digestion. So this is a really important part of the baby now starting to have digestion. Also, it acts like a lax laxative and pushes out that meconium so that the baby doesn't have too high of uh, bilirubin level or you know, a high level of jaundice. So there's so many things in the breast milk. There's lactoferrin, which also really inhibits the growth of bacteria due to its work. There's, you might have heard of IgA. There are these immunoglobulins. So they actually do these, these um, immune protection uh, actions. So it's just really a live organism of, um, of breast milk. So it fluctuates during the days and weeks and months and years um, during the baby's growth. So that's what I also call, a, this is communication. There's communication when you're pregnant with your baby to some extent, but when your baby is born and outside your body, this is the first what I call real direct communication between nursing and the baby's needs. So you're looking at the baby's feeding cues, which is awake, alert baby is your first feeding cue. So a little mouthing, little looking around, that means your baby's ready to nurse because that's really what the baby does at this point is just nurse, nurses and sleeps. And poops, of course, too. But this is a lot of the communication, really, the first couple of days. So um, realizing that this is that ecosystem, that the baby is needing to nurse, has these cues, then the, ba then the baby is breastfed, and then the, the, the body is responding, and, is and is, the baby stimulates this breast milk production. And so now we have what we call a supply and demand where the baby actually regulates the milk production. And this is where this ecosystem really comes in place. So the baby nurses, stimulates neurologically. It goes to the pituitary gland in the hypothalamus area. And hormones are released. 
prolactin produces the milk, and then oxytocin is released to have the milk let down, or we call it an eject, let down or a milk ejection reflex. And so this is really key in that communication. So this is the ecosystem that um, is occurring with breastfeeding. So lots of complex things occur during this time. Brain wiring is, is happening in the baby significantly as well as in the mom. And there's even evidence that when the dad does skin to skin and holds the baby, that brain wiring and prolactin levels change in the, the male. So this is a complex relationship of, of our species. So when the baby nurses, the, the body is responding and producing milk. And so this is where that communication occurs. And the wiring occurs, and the brain is actually wiring as they're breastfeeding. Here's another little interesting tip about brain wiring. The facial recognition area in the brain becomes more um, that the wiring occurs in that area of the region of the brain becomes more stimulated and developed because of breastfeeding, because the baby is right there at the breast, looking up at the mom, at the breast, looking up at mom. And they've shown that this, these are some of the specific changes in the brain wiring. So, so this also leads to the mother's protection, because the mom now, remember, after pregnancy, her body is still going through the lactation part of the, of the cycle. So there's lots of things that are occurring in the mom. So the risks of not breastfeeding are increased risks of these things. And we know the top three diseases affecting women are female cancers and heart disease and osteoporosis. But they don't benefit from like the better levels of HDL or some really wonderful things like weight loss, type two, two excuse me, type one diabetes or gestational diabetes. And this is this list goes on and on and on. But there's significant benefits um, to breastfeeding including when that oxytocin is produced. Um, here's another fun tip to know. When you're breastfeeding, your uterine contracts. And so that little cramping you might feel is really you know, promoting that uterine involution to kind of stop any postpartum hemorrhage or bleeding, which, leads, which could lead to iron uh, deficiency anemia. And so these are really important things. Again, that's that whole ecosystem, that whole cycle of what the relationship is between the mom and baby. Um, and it also can delay um, your periods, which is another nice benefit. And um, and in you know some um, relationships that could be used as that lactational amenorrhea to help with birth control. But that's you know just shows you the physiology of what's going on and how it's worked out. Mother Nature is just fascinating. So here's just a cartoon of the physiology of the breast. And these little milk-making factories, you know, that could be looked at as little florets or of a cauliflower or broccoli, these little heads of the aviolus, that's where the milk-making machines are. And when the hormones, this endocrine function and the secretory function starts happening, the hormones are, are stimulating this production. And these, these little tiny um, aviolus groups will contract and squeeze down and contract and push out milk down into the ductals. And this is the region where the baby will be latching on. Not at the very end of the nipple, but right here where the, um, the ducts come into play. Having a problem with my mouse there. Right there in that region. So um, really cool physiology um, of how complex our secretory and mammary glands are. So again, the important part is that Breast milk production is based on communication with the baby. So if we're having problems with the latch initially, that's going to affect breast milk production. And so this is a really, really important part that um, this needs to be maintained. And this happens right at birth in the first couple of days. So what I wanted to mention here is when you birth, you have a classroom produced in very small amounts. And I like this time because it's not a full, full breast that the baby is having to, to learn to latch onto. This is a great opportunity for practice. So you start practicing with breastfeeding. Small amounts, small amounts, lots of time at the breast. Keep the baby on your chest in between your, your breasts. Go back to, to sleeping and resting and relaxing and keep the baby right with you. And let lot, lots of opportunities occur with, with practice, practicing the latch. And it's great because you've got that smaller amounts of colostrum. So when the body starts changing from colostrum to the next phase of milk, 
the breasts are going to get a little fuller. There's, there's um, uh, fluid into the breast. There's blood flowing into the breast. The breasts get bigger all the way around, but that milk starts accumulating. So then it's a little difficult for that baby to latch on, possibly. So if you can practice a lot that first day or two, or maybe even three, before that change occurs, the baby's going to have an advantage, and so are you. So that's really important. And then when the baby's transferring adequately, and at day three or so when this occurs, this is a time to get that support. Check in with someone like a lactation consultant, back to your hospital, La Leche League, talk with someone that knows what they're doing. And they can just kind of wa walk you through things, maybe do a visit, and or go back to your doctor and get that support you need, but fix the latch. This is paramount. And so as a baby is getting efficient and transferring milk and doing a good job, then that baby will keep up with this production that you're making because your body doesn't know how much to make, so it's going to make a ton. And so then your baby's going to regulate that amount. And then your body will start. I wish I could, I could show you my hands. My hands are going up in the air saying, your, your breast milk is coming up, and the baby is you know, getting better, more efficient, and then your breast milk is going to level off to how much that baby is taking. And then you have this relationship. And then as the baby grows, nursing, 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 that's normal. A lot of suckling. And you say, oh my gosh, I don't have enough breast milk. Well, actually, you don't. And the baby's communicating this to you by suckling more, so you'll make more milk. And then the cycle continues as, she, as he or she grows. They'll suckle more for a day or two. You just keep nursing. It's stimulating the amount of breast milk and the composition change of the breast milk. And so then you maintain that level. And that will continue to go through different growth spurts. So the, the key piece here is breast milk production is dependent upon communication from your baby, i.e. suckling and nursing. And the latch needs to be adequate so that the baby is transferring that milk. And again, if you need to do some management like manual expression or using a pump or having a heat compress, like a, I often talk about using a, a hand towel, getting it wet, wring it out, put it in the microwave, get it nice and warm. Not too hot that you're going to burn yourself, of course, but something that allows nice warm heat um, uh, compress and put it around your breast that kind of vasodilates. Then you can do some massaging and some stimulation and help get that milk out so the breast is softer and then get the baby to take over and continue doing that during that engorgement phase. And maybe you can actually prevent that engorgement. But that's a big piece where a lot of women get tripped up on and just get that support to get through that. And you'll have a happy little baby like this. Um, this is a gal from our uh, board meeting a couple days ago from the Utah Breastfeeding Coalition. And um, she's a little shy to breastfeed the first time we met uh, last month. And, and we're all doulas and lactation consultants and moms. And, um, and this time she just, you know, we just supported her. Actually, last time she, she nursed and she did so great. But, you know, just a little uncomfortable. That, I mean, we're all a little uncomfortable. But once she did it for a couple of minutes, she was fine and comfortable. And this time she was nursing and the other gal was nursing her baby. And look, I just had to put the slide in. <laughs> so get yourself educated. Um, these are some sources. The Nursing Mother's Companion is still a really great book. Nursing Mother's Working Mother is a great book. There's La Leche League class meetings. There's prenatal, prenatal and breastfeeding classes. Don't wait too late in case you uh, get tied up in the last trimester with a lot going on. There's lots of online sources now. Our website is choosehealth.gov, and there's some breastfeeding resources there. Um, there's lots of great um, resources. You can visit Office of Women's Health, the CDC, a lot of great, great resources that you can just, you know, Browse through and pick up a few minutes here and there, and you'll be surprised how a little bit of information goes a long way. And baby-led baby -led feeding or laid-back breastfeeding is such a great way. I highly recommend this. Is, circle this on your notes. Jot this down. Highlight this. You can Google or YouTube it. Um, this is one that I picked up on um, that's by a reputable source. But look at it and look for nonprofits or coalitions that have this information or La Leche League. This is a great way to feed in the hospital. Basically, you're in a kind of a um, sitting up position, but laid back a little bit. You have your hands um, as bumpers around the baby, and the baby is placed on your chest. And the baby will find the breast. And the baby will bob its head, pull his head back, because he's on your chest with his little hands um, underneath, his, underneath his chin, and crawling up and pushing and trying to find the breast. And you have your arms around him like a, you're holding a beach ball, but like kind of bumpers around your baby. And the baby will flop around and finding the breast, and the baby will self-attach. And I love this. This is a fascinating experience to watch and, you know, have your significant others or other or whomever 
support in this in this position in this um, position of feeding and just let the baby take some time. You got all the time in the world the first day to just practice this. So this is highly recommended to do this in the hospital and the first days at home to set yourself up. Most women ask this question, how do I know if I have enough breast milk? You know, all women, all women ask this because why? Because they want to be good moms. 90% of women in Utah and around the world, many women start, the majority breast, start out breastfeeding, but not having the support. And so hopefully this information will assist you in knowing that you can do it just fine. So we talked about the trans, we talked about the supply and demand. So really, one of the most important things is, is your baby gaining enough weight? Of course, the baby's born, there's maybe fluid on board, they lose some body weight. Um, it's kind of a, uh, it's, it's not the true body weight of the baby, but the baby loses that weight and then starts to gain weight based on feeding. So what we want to see is by 10 days, the baby returning to that weight at birth. So this is really important to see as the baby starting to gain, you know, every couple of days or so and starting to, to rebound. And that is so important and based on the latch. So weight check. Is the baby on the breast every one and a half to three hours? Get the baby there, wake the baby if you have to. That means eight to 12 times in a 24 hour period. The first couple of days, it's all you're gonna be doing. Breastfeeding, breastfeeding, breastfeeding. Get this established, put this time in, relax, enjoy, let others do things for you so you can just focus on this. It will pay off. And you will have such a great experience with bonding and cuddling and making it easy to breastfeed and not have a sick baby. All of these great things that, that come with breastfeeding. And when the baby's at the breast, the baby's just sitting there with, with, a, with, your, with your nipple in its mouth and not transferring milk then maybe something's going on here. So when, if, if you say, oh gosh, she's been nursing for 30 minutes on this breast and 30 minutes on that breast, you have to look at how much the time is transferring milk. So look at that component and see what the baby's doing at breast. And that, again, is when you have an IBCLC come in um, or you know, use your support group to, to see that. And those are your, your mark off. So if you can say the baby has good weight gain, the baby's nursing every one and a half to three hours, you're nursing eight to 12 times in a 24 hour period, the, the breastfeedings are transferring, sucking, sucking, swallowing, sucking, sucking, swallowing, suck, swallow, suck, swallow, transferring milk, however long it takes to, for that baby's belly to get full, which might be, I've seen it as fast as four or five minutes, but typically it's maybe 10 minutes, 12 minutes, you know, maybe not quite 15 minutes, but like that. And a couple of breaks where you might have, you know, do some burping and whatever, but that's what a feeding should look like. So those are the things. Oh, and then whatever comes in, comes out. So that's a really good indicator. Wet diapers, six to eight in a 24-hour period is another good indicator that, hey, we've got lots of light urine diapers filling up. And of course, you want to see that meconium pass early on within the first few days and really pass that tarry, dark stool. And those are all signs that the baby was getting the colostrum and is now doing really well. So get resources on this as well. So in the hospital, now we're going to talk about the hospital. You know, in the 1990s, there was ho shorter hospital stays, and this really has affected our ability to breastfeed successfully. I mean, think about the trauma of birth, for one, but is this baby here ready to exclusively breastfeed and just sail on through without any problems? No, the baby needs some time, some patience, lots of practice. And so not everything is going to happen within the first couple of days and get it all perfect. Now, maybe it could, absolutely could. But what I'm saying is for a hospital birth, there's a lot going on. And so we don't have, you know, unlimited professional staff that are completely trained as IBCLCs in there every minute. I mean, it just doesn't happen. I mean, they've got a lot of other things to really make sure you have a healthy birth, and that's their number one priority. So breastfeeding is going to be secondary. And so these are some things we're going to talk about that you can set you up right in the hospital to help you make it a great experience. And that's where baby friendly hospitals came in. And I don't know if you can see this slide, but there's not only one, I think there's two baby moose nursing here. And the parking lot sign says reserve parking expectant mothers. And this went viral in my group about, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. But I thought it was very apropos because we really wanted to be friendly in the hospitals. And so, um, so what emerged to address these barriers in the hospitals that weren't following good practices is what's called um, the 10 steps. And they're practical tips that you can um, bring to the hospital 
and I suggest having a birth plan, and I have an example of what that could include, in a breastfeeding birth plan that checks off these 10 steps, and you can take it to the hospital, you can, you know, tack it on your bulletin board there, and so the hospital staff that are rotating in and out will know, hey, this is what she wants, we're going to, you know, we recognize this, and so they'll be your advocates because they know that you're on board, and in some places they, you know, they may, that, that might actually teach them a few things about what they should be doing, or it will um, allow them to, to not waste time with, um, you know, other practices that they would do, and they can be more efficient in their work, so. The 10 steps to successful breastfeeding can be found here, or you can Google it, and there's 10 steps, and the ones that are really applicable to you as a mom, they all are, but to a mom and dad is, is that, you know, one of the steps is that, you know, all pregnant women are informed about the benefits in the management of breastfeeding, and that you should be helped with the initiation of breastfeeding within the first hour of birth. In the international community, it says within the first half hour of birth. So immediately after birth, baby gets to be put on your on your tummy, and the baby gets to start being with the mother. Again, ecosystems should not be separated. There's a reason mom and baby stay together. Sorry, dads, but there's a ton of things that you can do to also um, relieve mom with doing the same skin to skin um, naked baby or with a diaper baby on dad's chest. You know, have a button down shirt or put a, a towel, a blanket over. And dad can do that as well. And boy, babies love to feel the skin of dad and the breathing and the smell and all of those things, the vibration of the dad, um, you know, firsthand now with, with hearing all of that and being close to dads. But moms and babies stay together. So that is another practice of rooming in where moms and babies stay together in the room 24 hours a day. They don't go to a nursery. And if something happens that's medically necessary, the dad or the significant other or the, whoever your advocate is, if you have a doula or whomever it is, your mother, they can go with baby so that baby is never left without you personally being there and making sure that the baby doesn't come back with pacifiers or artificial nipples or by any means formula or bottles at all. Those things do not belong in a baby's mouth. Baby is learning how to put the breast in the mouth and learn how to configure that highly sophisticated organization of suck, swallow, breathe. Really hard to do. And so these steps are designed for staff to be trained and policies to be in place so that women have this right, as we talked about, to, to establish breastfeeding in the early days. Very, very important. And so when you go home, you'll transfer all of these things to home so that you can continue on that path. Stepping Up for Utah Babies is a project from the Utah Department of Health that um, we've been doing where hospitals can volunteer to be involved and participate in this uh, program. So it's it's basically uh, two steps, two steps, two steps until all ten steps are completed. And it's a little bit less rigorous as the certification process for being a baby-friendly hospital. The University of Utah is our only baby-friendly hospital there. And they have implemented this um, over the years and um, are doing a fantastic job. So other hospitals are taking this on. So ask when you go to a hospital, are you involved in and in participating in the Stepping Up for Utah Babies program? This is a national program. Lots of states are, have been doing this over the years. Um, gosh, 10 or 15 years now, I think, as um, it's been going on. So um, hospitals can, can change policies. This is that checklist I was talking about. So it, it's hard to read, but the point is, as you can see, that um, there's different, you know, rooming in, and you would check. And it gives you a description of what that looks like. So this is a great resource and tool to have, and Darlene will have access to this. Yes. And again, we've talked about dads, so dad, this dad in the hospital is just a great way of, of doing the, the care, um, or again, with a, a younger baby or firstborn baby, you would have your shirt off so that they can even feel your, your chest and, your, and feel your skin. It's so much nicer to feel the skin versus, say, a glove on a hand when you do a handshake. Same thing. So the baby is all about tactile stimulation. So, and dads, you know, you can be the advocate enforcing and kind of guiding these ten steps. And think about things like, you know, keeping the traffic down to a minimum. You know, right after birth is not a time when everybody comes in in Grand Central Station. Everybody comes in to flock to see. Dad, you can put a note on the door and have the door shut and say, you know what, we're breastfeeding right now, or come back after 7 p.m., or this is the time we're taking visitors. Put it on your voice message on your, on your phone. Put it on your Facebook post and your Instagram and all of those, you know, social media places where you're communicating so you don't have interruptions the first few days and maybe even the weeks. And if they want to stop in, 
then they can stop in and you know drop off food or they can you know help help in that capacity. That's really what is helpful versus interruptions. You know when you're at work and people keep coming into your office, it's great, but you know it's not really you know getting you down the home stretch. So dads are great. I just love this shot. They're so cute and um, and we don't want dads to to inadvertently sabotage you know, your, the work that you both have decided to do. And you know what I hear too, dads keep saying, you know, well, gosh, you know, she just looked like she was having such a hard time. She was crying. She was emotional. And what I say is, you know what, these are all normal things. This is an emotional, highly emotional time. I mean, the, the hormones are changing over from being pregnant to postpartum. And you know what is the best thing. And she knows what the best thing is. So if you see her struggling, do the things that support her. And then she will find that that is true support and love and, that, and, and you know, carrying out her wishes and your wishes as well. So, um, you know, looking to, to find something like a pacifier, no, let's do skin to skin. Thinking about formula, no, let's fix the problem, let's make sure the latch is okay, let's get an IBCLC in. So these are things that you can do that are very tangible, not too difficult. And again, you know, Pregnancy was the hard part. Breastfeeding should really, the first couple of weeks, yeah, there's going to be some changes, but goodness, I mean, when I think about anything you do, you take on a new activity in your life, you're doing a new something at your church or your schools or with your kids or with your family, you know, it's, it's life. And the first couple of weeks are going to be a transition. So this last section is really, how do you successfully combine breastfeeding and employment? And Christina, what I love about Christina, she, she was a, another dietitian I work with, um, and she was really educated and informed. And I actually went to the hospital with her to check on her to see how she was doing that first day. And um, so there's still, you know, lots of things. Even if you're educated, you got to figure out. And you, you know, so we talked, and she she did great. But one of the things I remember about Christina that she did so well is when we would have meetings together. When she had to feed her baby, or she got a text from the daycare that she, you know, baby was, was waking up. She would excuse herself from the meeting. Everybody knew she had a baby to feed. And it was accepted and respected. And I respected her so much because she knew that work would be fine. She was on it. In fact, she went above and beyond to make sure she was on top of things and punctual in all aspects. So it wasn't reckless or it wasn't, you know, something that she just casually walked out of meetings. It was premeditated, deliberate, intentional to maintain her breastfeeding. And you know what? This is what is so great about um, breastfeeding is because she's going to be that really outstanding employee, just like you, I'm sure, would be to make sure that you're, um, you know, working well with all of your your teammates in your in your workplace. And um, Camille is an, uh, was another mom that did really well with breastfeeding, and you can see it kind of brings joy when you come to the workplace. And federal law through the Affordable Care Act um, had a provision that's that's national provision that says that women have the, act, the right to have access to expressing their milk at a work site in a private place other than a restroom and have the flexibility in their time to do so. So using your breaks or uncompensated time. So this is the, 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 the real uh, main pieces of this workplace accommodations and your work site should have this and we were, would be happy to help assist your work sites to have better accommodations, providing them information, resources, how to do this. So if you're in a workplace that doesn't have this completely worked out, contact Arlene and, and we can certainly help you with your workplace. This is what we do. This is what the Utah Breastfeeding Coalition does. That's what EPIC does at the Department of Health. Um, we work with, um, we have a work site coordinator that is also available to do this. So we have lots of resources that are free. So um, accommodating this is really, really huge to have this private place where a mom can, can um, can express her milk. A mom should be able to breastfeed anywhere that she wishes in the workplace. And here's an example of a breastfeeding room that we have in our Department of Health. Um, got a little refrigerator in there, have a hospital grade pumps, have some educational materials, comfortable place to, to nurse. And on the, this right side of this, of this room, there's two different rooms we offer so that moms are always having access. Um, it has a sink, a full sink, and an area where moms can clean up their, their kits and everything. So. Um, doesn't need to be super fancy, you know. And here's Camille again, and sh she did great with again the same information that Christina had access to. We talked a little bit about how to to um, do some planning, and she actually kept the baby in, in her office those first couple of months on and off. You can see how cute. Oh, that's what's going on. You're interrupting my break time here, but.
But um, you know, talking with employ employees, we'll talk about this in a minute here, your coworkers, finding a caregiver, and you know, figuring these little things out that, are, that aren't really too difficult to do. But Camille did a great job with nursing. And that baby is so cute. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the resources. It's a little bit older, but it's still a really relevant piece that talks about the return on the investment for the, the business, or the managers, or the employer. So they understand that you will be going the extra mile to make sure that you know you can still accommodate your your personal life with your breastfeeding. And I think the biggest problem is, is managers don't really know how to help or assist. They don't have clear information on, on what they can do. So this is a great resource because it gives them specific things on just understanding that, yes, having a, a private place is really important. And it's the law. And I'm sure that they want to comply fully. But you know, the flexibility in, in, your, in your time, that's, that's really important. And so that the supervisors and the managers below them are educated and informed. So um, you know, there's, there's information like there's a cost savings of like three to one. The, you're saving healthcare dollars because you're, you're not coming back with a sick baby. You're not taking sick leave. There's increased employee retention. There's greater morale. I mean, there's so many benefits that they can really um, take advantage of having breastfeeding families in, in the, their workplace. There's another resource here on, for the employer, or excuse me, for the employee on breastfeeding and working, and goes over some tips about you know how to plan, some practical ideas on how to talk to your employer. And you know how you can you know talk to your you know, your coworkers so that they're on board too, um, and I think a lot of that is just opening up communication. You know I have found that maybe some of um, the the women that are outside the age of childbearing years and have maybe grandchildren, they might have regrets because they didn't successfully breastfeed and it wasn't their fault. They did not get the support. That gosh, they didn't even have these type of policies or laws. They didn't have breast pumps, and they are trying to to survive and work like and contribute like all of us. You know that we're doing, and so it's sad that um, you know we have this regret. And I like to talk to moms about it as you know, it wasn't your fault, and it's this is lack of our society not supporting you. And so we want it to be more of a remorseful experience to look back and say, you know what, I did the best I could. You know, and a lot of us weren't breastfed. I wasn't. I wasn't or wasn't breastfed. I wasn't breastfed because of the exact same thing that my mom went through. And she wanted to, but you know, she was, you know, directed with different things that happened. And so, um, gosh, I wish I was smarter. I wish I had these immune properties. And my sister, who has lots of allergies and problems, and you know, but it is what it is. And so, you know, you advocate and you support. So you, as grandparents, can be um, or aunt age or whatever, can be supportive of your coworkers and um, and and help them make a difference in their experience. And that's what I really like about lactation consulting is because this is such an important time in your life and I, I see the, the success in these moms and how happy they are when they're able to successfully um, do this. Finding a caregiver or a facility that supports the, the, the process is wonderful. The, our Department of Health has this program called Top Star um, and because of that obesity issue of you know if babies don't get breastfed they have a higher risk of obesity. That's how this was funded through our CDC. So look for this in your worksite, in your worksite uh, care facilities or any caregiver facility that you're um, going to have your baby at, ask for the Top Star program. And basically, we're a program that um, helps uh, these facilities learn about policies that support breastfeeding. And so um, they're going to to support you when you come in. So when you, for example, when you when you drop your baby off, say if you're in a facility. The last thing you want to do is breastfeed that baby. So you get all your, you know, you, you drop the baby off in the diaper bag and you talk to the caregivers and then you sit down and you nurse. And so that's the last thing you do. So when you go to work, then you would either do your pumping or maybe um, there's some things we'll talk about here in a minute about how you can either have the baby brought to you or you can run over to the care center, especially in the first, you know, weeks or so. Um, but then when you get to go to pick up your baby, the first thing you do, wash your hands. Sit down and enjoy breastfeeding the baby. Don't bring the baby back in the car and then waste another half hour by the time you get to the house and you have other kids or you have other things going on that's going that's interfering. So capitalize on that tight time where you have some privacy and some quiet time and just you know nurse nurse that baby. And those are really some great things. And then on the weekends, you exclusively breastfeed. You don't worry about using a bottle of breast pumped, breast milk pumped. You don't, you just breastfeed, breastfeed, breastfeed. 
So on the site, on site child care is really important that they welcome and have chairs like this. This is Christina again, our our, um, our dietitian that was doing so well. This is Leo, her her um, her, her first, and she's got her her pregnant a little girl there who she's still nursing now, and she's about three and doing really really well. So some of the things you would look for when you're going back to work, possibly, I mean. Um, you know, some moms don't even need to pump. I, I was at that board meeting, right, a couple days ago, and she had reverse feeding down to a science. The baby was nursing all through the night, and she loved it. She just had the baby um, rooming with her at night in her room, and she just breastfed the baby all through the night and loved it. And then during her work hours, she did very little, um, you know, pumping. So um, it's not necessary to have a pump, but if you're separated, you know, your insurance covers it. I would say make sure you... Um, Talk to Darlene or make sure you, you find out what type of pump they have and what your uh, insurance covers because if you go to a, a facility, a home care, a medical supply place that provides pumps, they just might have what they have. And so do your due diligence, look them up online, see what is the better pumps and you can ask for that or you can ask to pay for the difference if, you're, if your insurance covers $200 and there's a $250 or $280 pump, it's well worth it to pay that extra difference in the cost. And they might have to order it, they may not have it there, but, but look for a pump because my concern is that you're, you, if you use a pump that's not effective for you, that then your breast milk production will start to go down and you won't know why. And that's a serious thing if we start to go down that path. So these type of personal use pumps are more for a personal use for temporary separated periods of time and it depends on how your body responds to it. This is a hospital grade pump that Medela makes. It's a, an older pump but it is a workhorse and we have those in our um, in our workplace. They're a hospital grade pump, pump and this is also another hospital grade pump. This is just one company but there's many out there so that's really important and again if you have a medical reason like the baby is not gaining or the latch isn't right, that is a medical situation where you need a hospital grade pump. Okay, that's not a place for the, a personal use pump. Again, talk with a lactation consultant. Breast milk storage, you can do it at desk side within your cooler or you can have a refrigerator, however you want to do it. You can keep it in your workplace. You know, just keep it in a container that's, you know, um, you know a little lunch bag or something. Milk can be stored in uh, plastic bags that are designed for that or hard plastic or glass. And um, just a rule of thumb is, is when you go to pump, if you know, refrigerate it for that day or so, and if you're not going to be using it, then go ahead and put it in the freezer. You might want to have them in small, two or three or four ounce sizes, depending on how much the baby's taking at a time. But um, you know, keep it so there's less waste, and um, and then you know, that works just fine for whoever's feeding the baby. Wanted to mention some ideas for maternity leave um, that you know you've got FLMA. It's still not enough time but make sure you um, plan that out as far as how much time you have so that breastfeeding is well established. So when you come in, you can just breastfeed and, um, and you know, just take it on over. It's so important to have that baseline established where breastfeeding is going really well. So Keely did a great job. She was our yoga instructor downstairs in our, in our building, and you can see how everyone was just welcoming the baby. It was really a lot of fun for her, but she actually brought her baby into yoga classes and um, was able to breastfeed, um, you know, while she was there at work, and maintain exclusive breastfeeding, you know, through her, um, through her working. Um, some of the things that also might be helpful, you know, for uh, when, when you return back to work is to have everything organized in advance so that you have your diaper bag, you have your clothes. What clothes you're going to wear yourself is, you know, might be helpful so that you have a loose-fitting blouse that you can either pull up to nurse or to pump or a button down shirt, have things like some extra pads in your in your diaper bag so that if you do any leaking, you can put a little bit of pressure by crossing your arms or, or putting some pressure with the palm of your hands on your breast if you start to leak and then get down there to feed because that's a sign that you need to feed <laughs> and or pump. Um, but some of those practical things, so you, you have a change of a blouse or a vest or something that you can um, you know cover up if you do do some leaking. Um, not a big deal, but if you're prepared, then you don't feel so stressed if something like that happens. Um, you know, pack your lunch, you know, plan those things out in advance. And, and our other aerobics instructor did the same thing with her baby. She just incorporated her, her, her baby into her exercise routine and was right there. And we had a blast uh, googly and gaga about <laughs> about after the, the class. So 
ways to, to make it a, tra a smooth transition back to work um, so that everything goes well and it's just accepted as the norm because it really is. So um, I'm trying to think of what else I missed about planning um, your, your pumping schedule. Um, the, oh, I wanted to mention watch underwire bras. That can put restriction on your breast line or if you're carrying heavy backpacks or diaper bags, don't have them across the, your arm um, in your shoulder so that it restricts that circulation underneath your, your t breast tissue that goes up into your arm um, when you're going back to work and carrying things down. Um, so introducing a bottle. Some babies that do such a great job at breastfeeding don't have any interest in using a bottle and that is great. That is great. So depending on what that situation is, I guess, again, I would say talk to your La Leche League person or uh, a lactation consultant to talk about what would be the best way to kind of do this. If the baby is doing super well on nursing and there's no problems, I'm not so freaked out about introducing a bottle once in a while. That baby will take that bottle pretty much. And you don't need to give it every day, every day. Just introduce it once or twice here and there so when you go back to work, the baby will take the bottle. And so that's kind of a, a good problem to have in a sense. But it can be very frustrating if the baby doesn't take a bottle at all and you're, going to rely, you're relying on breast milk in a bottle. Um, but don't introduce a bottle or a pacifier until everything is established really, really well. When you're using breast milk, you're thawing it basically in warm water. You don't need to do anything more aggressive than that. Certainly not in boiling water or microwave. No, 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 no. Breast milk dissolves very easily, so you can actually put it in the refrigerator um, be hours before, and it will thaw in the refrigerator or, again, in a, in a running hot water of a bowl, or some um, facilities will have... Um, you know, bottle warmers that can be used, but they don't need to be overheating it. And um, when you, um, I think I mentioned already, if you put it in the freezer, um, if you're not going to use it for a couple of days, put it in the freezer, and that will last for you know several months. If you're doing deep freeze, we say it can last you know even longer to six or twelve months. But you can always use that milk in in cereal feeding or cooking or whatever. Um, so that's that information. And so the last little bit I just wanted to mention. With all this information that you have, I think formula is used by moms that choose to, to want to breastfeed. They, they use formula because they're stuck and they're not supported. And it's so understandable. What we want to encourage is that we want breastfeeding to be successful. We want you to be successful. So if we're using formula, that means something is not working right. We need to go back a step and correct the latch or correct some of those things that are happening. Maybe it's something as simple as adding another breastfeeding in or adding another pumping in. So we want you to be very judicious going down the path of formula. It is not your first option when you're having problems. It is maybe your fifth or sixth option. There's many, many options to get this um, you know, relationship of breastfeeding going well. And I have this up here. This is the ingredient list of one infant formula and just kind of comparing you know, the, the properties of all the things you know about breast milk with formula. And it's certainly not something to have guilt about. Formula is something that is has been used, but I think we're using it inappropriately when we should be getting support and help to you and making you feel really confident in the decision that you had made to breastfeed. And we want to set you up for success to breastfeed successfully in an enjoyable relationship and really, really benefit from that wonderful experience. And so when you when you're thinking of using formula, call first. Talk to a lactation consultant and see where you're at, and help get you through those those issues and and concerns that you have to get you know get breastfeeding on the right on the right track. So um, that's what I wanted to talk to you about that with formula. So so we are in a society where way back with. Mickey Mouse and Pluto and all of these with the bottles are rep representing babies. That was the era when bottles were coming out and women were liberated, quote unquote. Only a couple of, you know, what, 10, 15 years ago, the Spice Girls, same thing. We're seeing a bottle, a baby bottle, for, for along with the perfume bottles and everything else. So it's in our culture. And, um, and I think it's also in our culture to, to breastfeed successfully and believing in breastfeeding that you can do it. This is another uh, photo that went viral that was so cute. And the mom's expression, the baby's B 
beat onto the breast, the bust of the breast, and literally went for it. And look at the mom's expression. So breastfeeding is normal. It's an everyday way of feeding a baby, baby. And historically, you know, moms have combined breastfeeding with hard work all throughout the world forever. So breastfeeding can work, and you can do it. Have confidence. And I hope this information was helpful to you. Thank you. Thank you for the, that great presentation, Judy, and thank you to the audience for joining us. We Care is PEHP's prenatal and postpartum program. If you want more information about breastfeeding or to enroll in We Care, please contact us at 801-366-7400 or go to the website.